If you've been following Digital Foundry for a while, you should know from my content on the channel that I'm a big fan of real-time strategy games. That's why I was excited a number of weeks back as I sat down with my colleague Tom Morgan to talk with Andrew Sabry from Frost Giant Games, who are currently making a real-time strategy game called Stormgate on Unreal Engine 5. In that interview, we talked about how the team is dealing with Unreal Engine 5 for a real-time strategy game, and how they're looking to innovate in the genre with cool rendering and networking technology. So without further ado, I'm going to give the mic away to my past self with slightly longer hair, and uh, take it away, Alex. Okay, so I'm going to ask uh, here the first question, getting into this right away, Andrew. Um, the interesting part of this is that there's like two internal... Uh, things running in the background here, Snowplay and, of course, Unreal Engine 5. What does Snowplay handle specifically, and what is Unreal Engine 5 handling in this configuration here of how the RTS game works? Uh, yeah, I'll start with the, the Unreal side. Uh, so that, I, I like to think of it as handling the sights and sounds. So we treat Unreal as the, the presentation layer. So anything visual you see, audio, animations, uh, even the UI, that's all driven um, and handled by the, the Unreal side. And then Snowplay handles pretty much everything else. Well, uh, like it all starts with the, the gameplay, so the simulation uh, and uh, everything related to, to the gameplay side of things. So we have a really nice uh, like separation of responsibilities there and they're they're fully independent and they, uh, from each other there. Okay, cool. Um, so when was the idea, when did the idea come around to actually do that instead of using, for example, like UE5 and just plugging in your own gameplay there, like C++ or even Blueprint, like why Snowplay and UE5 for visuals and sounds? Yep. So uh, it all goes back to like when Frost Giant first started and trying to accomplish the goals for the game we're making. So we're making Stormgate, which is a real time strategy game. And uh, right from the outset, we wanted to make like the next generation or the next great RTS. And in order to do that, we came up with four key pillars that we wanted to make sure that, that we hit uh, campaign competitive co-op and, and custom games. Mm -hmm. So we explored all like the different off the shelf solutions like Unreal and Unity, and uh, none of them really by themselves put the bill to, to accomplish what we were going after for that like really responsive uh, like engine that could handle like really high unit counts in the hundreds or even over a, a thousand. Mm -hmm. so, uh, that's when we realized, oh, okay, we need to start looking at like our own custom solution to make all of that possible. Hmm. Oh, okay. Well, that actually, actually, I'm just going to piggyback back off of that because there's a, something you mentioned there with a lot of units on screen. And I was just thinking about a lot of the UE5 games I've seen so far um, where it's, you know, just like a handful of skinned units, like of individuals in a screen, uh, but they're not hundreds of, you know, units on screen at a time hundreds of animating characters uh does that mean snowplay is actually doing like all the skinning and everything like that and how is actually the animation done in the game to make maintain the performance because i think a lot of games um i'm just thinking now on like company of heroes for example like they uh degrade the animation rate of things at a distance uh, or on lower settings and things like that how how you do an animation here uh, so all of that is, as much as I'd like, love Snowplay to take credit for as much as it could, all of that is handled on, on the Unreal side. So the, the two no. real bottlenecks for like going over like 50 or 100 units with Unreal are uh, on the network side, just having to replicate that much data um, between the client and server, and then on uh, the, like, the just sheer number of like full, fully functional actors and mm -hmm. running the simulation side of things. So those are the the two main ones. So Unreal handles all the skinning, all the all the rendering, like all of the non-deterministic physics, uh, one hundred percent. Right. Uh, and we do a few things to, uh, to to make it a little bit like reduce the cost on the rendering side, but for the most part, Unreal's pretty good. Nice. I uh, got to jump in here about the number of units uh, possible. Um, it seems like. 
looking back to StarCraft 2, the CPU side of like just getting the game to run when you get to the climax of a game with like all 200 units, say, uh, on every side was like where things really came crashing down on my rig back then anyway. Um, is the move to UE5 and especially with the pathfinding handled by Snowplay kind of, um, does that make it easier on the CPU? Is it a better optimized setup these days? Uh, to handle that many individual actions and animations, obviously, all at once. Uh, yeah, so the that is the core reason why we decided to uh, go with Snowplay and do the entire simulation just in-house. Uh, all of it's thanks to uh, James Anhalt, who is the chief architect that's kind of the mastermind behind it all, of taking all that experience that they learned from building StarCraft and Blizzard RTS engines and just building our simulation in Snowplay just from the ground up, right from the get-go to support that, that many units. So the it all comes down to how fast can you process like all those units in terms of like the collisions, the pathfinding, uh, all their abilities. And by taking all that knowledge, uh, knowing we had a target of around three times the speed of StarCraft II, um, mm -hmm. And just starting from there, uh, all of our decisions just kind of gravitated around that like, really responsive gameplay for, for really, really high unit counts. I'd like to talk about the pathfinding as well, because uh, uh, um, this is actually a question from Will, but I totally agree with the, the, the premise of it. Like uh, pathfinding in StarCraft 1, if you remember, especially certain units, uh, I think Dragoons maybe, um, <laughs> the Protoss, they had some issues getting from A to B and much improved in StarCraft 2. Is there sort of what level of improvement does uh, sort of Snowplay allow for in terms of, is it, is it, uh, does it enable a much improved level of pathfinding compared to what we saw before or is it about kind of a similar level? Uh, yeah, our original target was like at least get to par with uh, <laughs> the StarCraft yeah. 2, and that, that was an ambitious target to start with. Um, so uh, all the learnings that, that James had from StarCraft 2, because he has a famous GGC talk on like everything that went into pathfinding, like yeah. he took the lessons learned and put them into, into Stormgate. And uh, there's still a lot of work to do, but we've at least hit the same uh, bar and in a way that's far more performant than StarCraft 2 was. And we're going to be continually improving and handling all the edge cases, uh, which is typically what kills pathfinding is all the, the nuances and edge cases and that specific scenarios that, that you have to deal with. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, uh, I'm fairly optimistic we'll be able to exceed StarCraft II's uh, expectations there yeah <laughs> i don't i don't remember any issues with starcraft 2 to be honest it was just the first game i remember just wandering units <laughs> yeah, yeah i, I mean that's I think, good to hear i think one of the things i always notice actually in rts games is when units of different sizes interact with one another um they like which one gets priority to like for example if, like you have the equivalent of like an ultralisk and a zergling when they start walking around each other that's when you get into issues in games i've always noticed and there is actually quite a different unit size in this game i noticed between like the smallest and the largest so that's one thing to see for in the final product. Um, but I'm actually curious about which version of UE5 you uh, chose to like start with in terms of integration. Like, which version of UE5 are you on right now? Yeah, we started with, uh, I, I can't remember if we started with the tail end of 4 and then immediately upgraded to 5, but almost all of our development has been on Unreal 5. Uh, oh, wow. So, right. so we had that sweet spot of... The preview was ready just as we were hitting like full production and mm -hmm. uh, we've been on five like, right from the, the onset. And given like the separation you talked about earlier is say, since it is just primarily rendering, uh, is it easy to integrate like five, like if you're on five, two right now, is it easy to upgrade to five, three and then five, four iteratively over time to get all the advancements from them? Or is it actually a challenge? Yeah, it's relatively easy. We're mostly vanilla Unreal. Uh, there's a few customization, customizations we had to make uh, to do some UI improvements, but mm -hmm. the upgrades have been fairly seamless uh, and not a big tax on the team team at all. So we've been pretty pretty close to staying up to date uh, with each, each release that's come out. Okay, that's amazing. So um, as a part of UE5, this is, this is my question because it's always been my bugbear since like, five years ago. I'm going to ask about 
Um, right now, is the game using the DX12 renderer in UE5 or DX11 renderer, actually? There is a DX11. Currently supporting both. Uh, we're getting better results, oddly enough, with DirectX 11, uh, but mm. we aren't sure exactly why. Uh, that's something we're going to be looking into downstream. Oh, one like big disclaimer uh, is we are still in active development, so there's yeah, of course. A lot of questions where yeah. I could say, yep, yeah, we're we're looking into that. <laughs> yeah, right now we support both DirectX 11 and 12. We saw with our uh, closed testing that DirectX 12 wasn't quite as stable or as performant as we expected it to be, so we'll be looking into that. Okay. Um, because like one of the big issues is just um, PSO compilation stutter, shader compilation stutter in Unreal Engine 5. And depending upon the version you're using, can be better or worse and uh, what steps the team. Uh, basically, do you have it on your minds as development is going on to make sure that the, the game is pretty stutter free when it does come out? <laughs> uh, yes. So we <laughs> haven't observed any of that in our latest round of testing. But it's something that as soon as we see any of like the smoke or reports of it, we're going to be jumping on to ensure like, it's not a problem with our game. Okay, good. <laughs> um, and in terms of UE5 uh, basic features, like the, the ones that it was really advertising heavily, VSM, Nanite, Lumen, um, is the project looking to take advantage of any of them for like even higher... Um, higher graphical settings at all? Or are you going to stick with like older technology to keep the frame rates up? Uh, so the there's a lot of nuance to that question. So the answer is yes, we explored and are exploring all of the, the newest technologies. The one we're currently using is Niagara uh, to really give us those like really cool visual effects like across the board. And that's been uh, just a delight to see that, mm. that life and what our VFX artists can do with it. Uh, for Nanite, we are planning on exploring that um, in the next couple of months, just to see mm -hmm. what we can leverage from there. But um, so far, we haven't been been using it. Lumen, that one we really were excited about, uh, just in what how amazing the lighting can be. Uh, just like Unreal out of the box doesn't support uh, what we need from an RTS on the, the simulation side. Mm -hmm. uh, the the Lumen uh, assumes it's a first person or a third person perspective with a contiguous camera in order for it to, I guess, pre calculate the yeah. moving around. But with an RTS, yeah, you have to jump around uh, to all the different parts of the map. So it looked really good, but there's like a frame or so of like this little visual like update <laughs> that you can kind of see. Uh, I see. It it. And that, that's something that. Uh, we've had a table it for now, and we'll see if they can uh, make some improvements there. Um, I, I guess uh, on a similar vein to that question, with the potential for really high-end features, Lumen uh, and beyond, that could really tap into higher-end GPUs. Is there a kind of mindset as well to keep things visually quite consistent for competitive play between someone who play on a low-end machine and a high-end machine? Are you kind of aware of, uh, you know, keeping like the visibility of uh, units the same uh, in order to keep things fair in online games? Yeah, absolutely. So our, like one of our like core values as a part of building great games is like gameplay comes first and the visuals need to be beautiful and look great, but that, yeah. that it's, uh, I wouldn't say a backseat, but it's a, a long for the ride. I, uh, <laughs> yeah. Better, better way of saying it. Uh, so all of our testing, we, uh, we have like lower spec machines that we make sure all the visuals have a, a fair, uh, have no additional gameplay advantage. Mm -hmm. So anything like our uh, infernal shroud effect, where you can see units going through the shroud, shroud we make sure that is going to work and function uh, in an identical way as it would at yes. uh, the higher end uh, machines. So I guess the the you know, moving to Snowplay allows for this incredible netcode as well, am I right in saying? And that's a huge positive for like the competitive scene. And there's a three times uptick in uh, the poll count, like the update uh, compared to StarCraft 2. Um, is it a, just a, a difference in technology between the two or is there a difference in the philosophy and how it's designed? How is that kind of managed in terms of how it's implemented? Yeah, the, the high level approach to the technology is pretty, pretty similar. And it's similar across like all games that use what we call like a deterministic simulation. So we're not really inventing anything 
novel there. We're just taking all the, the lessons we've learned in the past and purpose built uh, Snowplay from the ground up to be as performant as possible in order to hit those tick rates. So like uh, using the mindset of optimizing right from the get go to make sure we have performance in mind. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the, I'd say if there was one thing that that's like the, the differentiator but that, that we brought with with Snowplay. And then uh, a lot of the lessons learned as uh, from StarCraft and then many of us are from other companies that also worked on deterministic simulation titles. Uh, we learned downstream that there's all these features that you need to be able to support uh, that weren't a part of the original planning. So replays are a big part of it, which yes. typically yeah. you're, you're aware from the get-go. Mm, yeah. The ability to observe and spectate games that came uh, on a, a little bit more downstream. And then there's newer, better ways to be able to approach um, spectating. And then, um, yeah, just a, a whole suite of things that, that all kind of tie into that, that core simulation needing to be ultra fast and then different general techniques for making sure that, that it is uh, as performant as possible. And one of the techniques, which I hopefully will ask some questions around it is rollback. So that's one yes. thing that we never uh, uh, like, never really thought about being something viable for uh, for RTS at least ten plus years ago when the original engines were developed. So that's something we had in the, the front of mind when developing the tech. On on ro rollback, especially that's also something I you know celebrated quite a lot in the fighting game community. Uh, with uh, I think remember Street Fighter Three had one of the first implementations of rollback way back when uh, people used it before it was even possible. Uh, officially um, on their own servers, I remember that. Um, but it was always a fighting game thing, and I wondered if translating that to an RTS is it um, is it a smooth translation? Is there are there uh, like advantage or advantages or challenges to making it work in an RTS sort of scenario? Uh, the short answer is yes. There's lots of yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, the and we were we knew we were being very ambitious with. Uh, you know, trying to tackle tackle rollback, the, but uh, the the two things that we knew would be challenges ahead are RTS's simulation is like especially to support the high unit counts and just like how much is going on are typically heavier or more expensive than a fighting game. So we knew there's a lot of effort that had to go into performance right from the get go. And then the other and one of the downsides of rollback is when you do instantiate that rollback, there's the potential for some like visual artifacts when you re-simulate. Mm -hmm. And with RTS, there's a lot of just visual effects and abilities going off. So we're a bit apprehensive or curious and uh, interested in like how that would actually manifest when when you're, you're playing through it all. Mm -hmm. D did you notice as a result of that? Cause like, um, like at what point, if you have a rollback, and at like what point does it become visually obvious from like the RTS perspective? Obviously, in a, in a you know in a fighting game that has like hit stops and things like that, it's less obvious. But since the motion is so fluid with all your units on screen, like what does a rollback look like in your game if it were to occur? Uh, so in the the by far most common case, you don't notice it at mm -hmm. all. But in those cases where you do go back and re-simulate and it does like change the present based off of like what your opponent did. Right now, the, the two that come to mind are if a unit dies, like it, you will see the unit death and then it'll suddenly like come back and it's like very quick, but you know, it, mm -hmm. it is cool. And then the other ones are like with that projectile missile, you'll see the projectile launch with the VFX and then all of a sudden it'll just briefly, briefly go away. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's far less frequent than we feared. Um, and for the most part, you don't really notice uh, much, if any at all, like during uh, during a normal game. So so those are just like the very shorthand negatives and they sound very good. Um, but like, what are some of the big, from the testing that you just recently had with the most recent uh, opening of the, like the beta exactly of the in-development code? What were some of the positives you noted from uh, implementing rollback already? So the the biggest positive was just the 
overwhelming uh, just support, enthusiasm, just like joy of like how much better the, the gameplay felt. Mm -hmm. uh, so we got across the board just positive feedback on, hey, I haven't been able to play an RTS because uh, I, the best ping I can get is 100 milliseconds. <laughs> and they're delighted to actually be able to play one now. We had one instance of somebody having to stay in a hotel room with terrible internet, and they were able to play, and everything felt smooth and responsive. Mm -hmm. And then uh, we actually have a few pros that are participating in the, the closed testing. And they, they uh, parting specifically, like a, a, a renowned StarCraft II pro said it made his gameplay feel you know, much, much better and more responsive while we had the rollback testing on. So it's not all like sunshine and, and roses. Like there are a few players that were experiencing um, some challenges and that's what we're taking and actively looking through, um, how to make that better for them. Mm. Yeah. But uh, the, sorry to keep it going, but yeah, yeah. like we yeah, were like anxious and like excited because that was the point where it's like, okay, there's some bugs here, but things look great in our local, like internal testing and things look pretty, pretty darn great with like our contrived, um, <laughs> like contrived poor network conditions where we would simulate packets loss and things like that oh, so I see. Time to get like the real world testing even though there's still some bugs there but uh mm. yeah we were only planning on having it up for just a few hours and the response was so great we decided to keep it on for a couple extra days that's great and i, I know you've got another alpha booked for december is that right it's called devastator or yeah okay. the name devastator yep um it'll yeah. be sometime in in december yeah is there like i know it's uh, very like soon but is there any feedback from that you've taken already like all right we're going to definitely implement this for the next time the next alpha we're going to have this kind of ready uh yeah so there were uh i'll just fully be transparent about the issues we saw there was a, a desync that we saw um that uh, if you're not familiar with deterministic simulations all the clients have to run the same exact simulation without deviating whatsoever so that they can stay in sync uh so far snowplay has been phenomenal like we hadn't seen a single desync period mm -hmm. uh with any of our closed testing but with rollback it does increase the likelihood of of seeing a desync since you have to go back and re-simulate and restore the state of the world when you do that. So we did see one of those that the community was great in helping us uh, track down. Um, we've addressed that one for sure. And then there are a few uh, just uh, known visual like artifacts as a result, like a projectile starting, but just staying in the world because we never actually went back and cleaned it up as a result of mm -hmm. Unreal needing to have uh, some awareness of what's going on. That that makes sense. I mean, this is like very new. It's kind of a, like a, a new frontier, I guess. Not many people, no one's tried this before and you, you're pretty much the first to kind of go for it and try rollback code in an RTS. Um, the idea of it being, uh, is there a chance that you, if it is successful and if it works and it seems to be, uh, that you would uh, license it out maybe to other uh, studios to kind of, um, because, you know, the rising tide floats all boats, as the saying goes. Would that be something you'd consider, like, for other RTS titles? Uh, that is something we're considering downstream. Like, we mm -hmm. are holding it from the ground up to just run fully agnostic from whatever game engine. Um, mm. So it's built as a, a DLL. Just Wow, OK. That's cool. Okay. So if we wanted to, we could use Unity or whatever off the uh, that's great. engine that's there. Uh, so at, at some point, yes, right now we're still in active development. Um, yeah. But that is a, like a, a long-term aspiration. Uh, worst case, or I guess good case still, uh, if and when we build like the next Stormgate or another title, uh, mm -hmm. we'll be ready to go for uh, whatever the game might be. Awesome. Um, I actually have a question regarding a couple uh, like specs things. Like what is the minimum spec target exactly for the game for what you would consider like good like a lot of people on pc these days consider like 60 fps a minimum so what is your minimum spec look like actually uh so we are still in active development and we're trying to like narrow that down have to give that disclaimer up front uh but windows 10 uh 
at a, at a minimum, ideally uh, higher than that. Uh, CPU is pretty darn important, especially for rollback. Mm. The faster the CPU, the more frames you can go re-simulate. So um, that's one of the, the main things that we're focused on optimizing right now. For that six cores, uh, one for Snowplay, and then the rest to let Unreal do its magic. Uh, around 2.3 gigahertz is where we're seeing pretty decent performance there. Uh, minimum of 16 gigs of RAM. Uh, Unreal, with all its greatness, is a bit you know memory heavy. And then uh, right now, at least in our closed testing, like around a GeForce GTX 1060 or something around those lines. So graphics card that's just a, a few years old mm -hmm. but we're planning on continuing to optimize and make, make life better there um so it's pretty like awesome to be on a project where we're doing close testing like all the way through um development so we can hit a certain performance bar and then continue to optimize like as we go where it's a lot of projects i've been on just wait till the very end mm -hmm. To try to optimize as far as they can there. <laughs> um, so you mentioned there uh, six cores, one and then five for Unreal, one for um, Snowplay itself in the background. But does Snowplay itself also, all of the simulation, the deterministic simulation, uh, is it actually multi-threaded? Um, how, how do... I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, no, I'm just wondering, how, how does it work? How is it like architected? Yeah, for, for right now, it is just a single thread. Um, it's so fast uh like we're targeting like 64 hertz um so i'm not going to do the math in my head but yeah, yeah. Uh, but yeah the uh to keep things deterministic uh a single thread is much easier and we're able to just go really fast especially uh in the rollback scenario we actually found that by simulating multiple frames uh, all from one thread uh just all in one go we get a lot of performance of like benefits from just everything being in cache and mm -hmm. uh, yeah. i worked on games that went multi-threaded with deterministic sims and it's a huge pain to keep everything <laughs> deterministic just with the threads running at different yeah uh, or finishing at different times and keeping all that in sync um so that we're definitely keeping it open for the future if we need to but for right now we're keeping it simple Okay, yeah, I was I was curious about that because when you said deterministic right at the beginning of this conversation, I was like, oh, what, yeah, but what about multi-threading? So that's really cool to know. Um, I have a question then about scaling. Um, Unreal Engine 5 uh, supports TSR, like um, to um, scale the resolution up and down really nice uh, and get also good clean quality. Do you plan on supporting any of the third-party scalers at all, like DLSS, FSR2, XCSS, frame generation? At, uh, if someone wants to turn that on? Uh, so the, the main one we're looking at right now is DLSS. We just implemented it and it's magical, like for if your graphics card supports it. Mm -hmm. uh, we're not banking on that to get our, our yeah. you know, hit our target frame rate, but it, we see yeah. it as like, just a really convenient boost if you have a card that, that does support it. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the others, uh, most of those acronyms, I admit I don't know, but we're going <laughs> to... As, as we as we get uh, time freed up, we're looking at uh, implementing them. But, um, oh, okay, that's awesome. And uh, obviously, I took a peek at the graphics menu settings. You've got uh, it's early days. Obviously, uh, there's a, a kind of a general global toggle for going up to ultra, I believe. Um, is there it plans to make like a more nuanced, advanced graphics m m sort of menu for people who want to dive into all the others? The textures, lighting, shadows, all the usuals. Um, is that something that's on the cards? Uh, yeah. So I, I don't know exactly where we're going to land for each of those, but effectively, yeah. as soon as we find a, a need to uh, you know, play with it ourselves internally, we, by default, will make uh, a new menu option just so that um, it's something our players can, can benefit from. And that's where almost all of those menu options that are in the game right now uh, come from. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Earlier, you talked about Lumen having like a one frame and then some like accumulation frames afterwards, which was causing like visual oddities when you would click around the map, and that makes a lot of sense to me. Did uh, jet, developing an RTS uh, and the visuals for it, has there been other instances of that too as well that you've noticed uh, with UE5's rendering that 
you know, it's kind of developed for contiguous first person or third person camera movement. But did you notice any oddities elsewhere that you would like to talk about or challenges in making RTS work on Unreal Engine 5? Uh, so the, in terms of just out, uh, like oddities or things that we had to work around for RTS, there wasn't many um, mm -hmm. outside of the, the, the lighting side of things. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the things that we are, are doing that is presenting a ton of challenges is we aren't using Unreal's terrain editor, just out of the box. One of our core focuses is uh, all the development tools that we're using to build our campaign, our custom, or our internal maps, we want to be able to provide to players. And a big aspect of that is the ability to edit and create terrain. Hmm. And uh, we can't just ship Unreal tools yeah. like with the game. So we did have to uh, build our own uh, terrain editor and our own full on uh, trigger editor. So for that, uh, all of that's like homegrown. So, uh, the, so to, in short, to support uh, the map creation tooling that you'd expect from an RTS, like we weren't able to use any of the Unreal uh, terrain solutions there. We can still leverage a, a lot, but the tooling itself is, is all homegrown. It is uh, how is actually the terrain editor work? Is it like a height map height map based thing that you're painting in? Yeah. Or yeah, it is. Okay, cool. It's like you fully paintable, so you can paint terrain, you can paint cliffs, uh, like, and uh, yeah, there's a there's a whole lot that goes into it. Okay, that's kind of awesome. And just a quick question about like, so how exactly does the uh, pathfinding work on like the the terrain that someone has painted? Like, what exactly is the pathfinding? Is it a mesh? Is it something else? So as you're painting, we'll dynamically generate the, a pathing mesh. Um, cool. Like, as, as you go. So that's just getting computed in uh, close to real time as you're uh, just painting the, the terrain, adding cliffs, uh, adding trees, which has uh, been a huge undertaking. It's almost like a, <laughs> within our company that almost every milestone, we've had something to, to do with trees. <laughs> yeah. Two new trees. Those trees. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so for those just to geek out about it, um, mm -hmm. uh, the uh, every tree is uh, we wanted to have a, a gameplay like element to it, and we also wanted to be like really visually appealing since it'll cover uh, the, a, a large majority of some of the, the our forest like biome maps. Uh, so for that, each one uh, like has to simulate in snow play so that we can, if you destroy it, we can update the, the pathing mesh like with the yeah, dynamic footprint. Mm -hmm. and, uh, we also want it to look visually good, which we can't really simulate um, or, uh, or at least if we wanted to target lower end machines, we couldn't use uh, some of the uh, out of the box Unreal. So just a shout out to our tech artist, namely Rafal. He implemented a compute shader mm -hmm. to handle all of the, the visual sides of like units when they're in proximity of the tree, you can see them actually like moving it and causing like little disruptions there. Cool. The destruction of the tree, like exploding, um, all of that without the, the need for like any physics calculations. Uh, and it really substantially reduced the, the rendering cost of things there. I guess as a, as a StarCraft II fan, is there, I got some nerd questions about like uh, what what the plans are for the future, and is there like um, the, the sort of races you have in mind? Um, I believe there are two right now, and there are plans for. Is it going to be kind of like um, you know a rock paper scissors uh, situation triangle, or is it going to be you're going to go all out? I know this is a far out question, but you know, is it going to be many races that you can choose uh, rather than just the three? Yeah, the, the current plan is targeting three. The two that we've announced and you can play right now are mm. the Resistance and the Infernal. So the Resistance is more your traditional, like, human uh, faction yeah. uh, that players will be, like, more eased into the, the genre for. And then we have the Infernals, which is our more demonic race. Uh, mm. that we're doing lots of fun stuff with. Then we have a third race that we're keeping... Uh, <laughs> Uh, big seeker right now uh, that we're really excited for. That's cool. And there's a story mode as well in, in this as well uh, with cinematics planned. Um, 
Is that right? Are you planning on using pre-rendered cinematics or going in-engine since UE5 has got a decent tool set to do to, to a lot of in-engine stuff? Yeah, so all of our cinematics are in-engine. Uh, cool. And we're we're Good. Like running on just, <laughs> it's like pretty awesome just to be able to like just see it all running in real time. So that's definitely uh, the plan as of right now. It saves on the install size, that's for sure. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, it's yeah. so much better. I, I love in-engine cinematics. It's actually one of my favorite parts about StarCraft 2 is that they did all that back then. That was always so much fun. Um, yeah. I've dealt with the nightmares of like gigs of video that you have to like <laughs> try to compress and just make it look as high quality as you can. Um, so I'm thankful to not have to go through that again. Yeah, yeah. that sounds great. Um, um, we, are, we are planning on a full, full experience uh, single player mode and we are like dog fooding our own tooling as as we build it the the hope is that our campaign tools and are good enough that players can take them at some point after we release the the core game we're trying to get that up first but the goal is that they can make their own games within games like uh we saw with uh blue star rts's with things like mobas or whatever our content creators can, can come up with no that's awesome um regarding uh just kind of supporting stuff on PC since you've mentioned cinematics. Um, 16 by 9 standard typical resolution, but obviously you start getting into competitive differences with different ones. Like, is there support, planned support for cinematic monitors, 4x3 monitors, anything like that? I mean, yeah, well, I can't speak to exactly which format we're gonna like ultimately land on, but we're going through, uh, all the different like permutations on aspect ratios and so on. And looking for like the most common ones, the ones that players like uh, really are seeking uh, high quality for and keeping all of those in mind. And it's driving our UX guys a little bit nuts, but that's mm. uh, <laughs> uh, more seriously, they are the ones that are passionate about supporting like everything we possibly can. Mm -hmm. Hey. <laughs> Awesome. Thank you so much for your time. Like, uh, it's been really great. Uh, yeah, I'm just looking forward to seeing another made, like, RTS making a kind of revival. There's been yeah. a lot, with a lot campaign. of RTS. With a campaign. Yeah, with I'm, a campaign. I, I love campaigns. Like, it's one thing that I always feel like, since this competitive is so important, actually seeing someone actually care about a campaign in an RTS game is really awesome, I think. Yeah, yeah we're incredibly ambitious, but we have a, a world-class team that's... Mm -hmm really that feels the same exact way uh we're really missing the the next rts um and uh we're all passionate about delivering uh, across the board on all those things uh we do plan on uh being a live service so it won't be just like we uh launch and then we're done we'll be continuously creating content like all the all the way through so um that's another thing that snowplay sets us up well for is just our content creation tools to just Keep it coming and keeping out the great gameplay and storytelling uh, alive. Awesome. Well, uh, thank you so much, Andrew, for talking to us today. Yep. Thank you for the opportunity. And I have to plug, like, please wishlist us on Steam. The game is Stormgate. And uh, mm -hmm. we appreciate the support.